morning all um, and welcome to the um, Syngenta Allium Crop and Agronomy, Agronomy webinar. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stilton, I'm one of the portfolio managers um, for Syngenta on the crop protection side. So this morning um, we're going to give you a bit of an update in alliums. Um, before we do that, just a few housekeeping uh, things to make you aware of. Just to make you aware of, you may have noticed that this webinar is being recorded um, and the recording will be posted onto the Syngenta, um, Syngenta UK UK YouTube channels. Um, we thoroughly encourage questions um, and if you'd like to ask the panellists or, or myself any questions, then we ask you to do that in the Q&A function on Zoom. If you can't see that on your screen currently, if you hover your mouse towards the bottom um, of your computer screen, then you'll get a black um, bar pop up and you'll see the, the Q&A function there. If you type your questions in, um, I'll facilitate answering those with the, with the presenters as we go through and at the end of the presentations. Just to let you know, you will see, receive a follow-up email um, for the, from this webinar where you'll be able to claim your basis and Neuroso points. Um, and there'll also be a link to a small feedback survey, about half a dozen questions, um, which would be grateful if you complete so we can shape um, meetings going forwards. So this morning, um, we will hear first from, from Nigel, Nigel Kingston, and he's gonna start with a bit of a, a season update um, and give you a roundup on what's happening with varieties and veg seeds. We'll then pass over to Michael Tate, um, and he'll go through different fungicide options from a crop protection point of view, and we'll finish off with Max Newbert, who'll give us an insecticide um, update. So without further ado, we'll kick off um, and I'll ask Nigel if he can start sharing his presentation and we'll um, look forward to hearing his season update. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my first Zoom webinar and uh, how exciting, actually. It's, uh, and I hope you find this, uh, what I'm gonna do and, uh, and show you. I'm gonna start sharing it now. Hopefully you can see that. We can. Uh, thank you. Rebecca, can you confirm we can see this? We can see it. Thank you. Perfect. We'll start. So uh, on the agenda, if I can go to the next slide, which I'm trying to. OK. Yes, we got it. <laughs> uh, right, the agenda, weather 2020. Establishments and the season, social media, love it or hate it, but we do love onions. Uh, area and market and the varieties uh, from Syngenta and the prospects. Uh, and also a bit about fusarium, neck rot and seed treatments. Well, we start at the weather, actually. Um, we always start here. And um, I've always been very interested in uh, recording the rainfall. And um, this is not actually from myself, but this is from a Syngenta site, but we all knew we had a very dry March, April, May. Uh, many crops were, were irrigated to get them established. And in September, we had ideal harvesting conditions. Um, um, yeah, it was, it, it was spot on, but then we had a very wet October. Uh, November was, uh, quite dry um, and help to just clear up those last few that are about. And then of course, we know it's never stopped raining since. The temperatures, um, the temperatures uh, were above average at drilling, which definitely helped um, in, in the irrigating and the dry conditions. But that's if it went on evenly. Um, it was very, very windy at that time. So it made it very tricky. So we've got situations like this, uh, 15th of May, most crops uh, were irrigated once uh, uh, and, and up to four times. And this was some light sand. This was some light sand, um, 37 in a metre square there. The same field uh, was actually, uh, you can see, we had up to 81%. And this is the same field. Uh, just slightly more bodied land made all the difference. I think this was hit by uh, a pre-emergent herbicide 
which you know can happen uh, on that uh, on that type of light sand. Now you've heard me, you've you've uh, known me a long time. A lot of these people, a uh, few grey hairs, um, and I always say, well sown is half grown, and it's so true. I mean, this is a lovely looking crop. A vision on the 13th of June, already at six true leaves which is, is phenomenal. You know, we always say we'd light them at five true leaves uh, by the longest day. And these were actually on the 13th of June, six true leaves. And I think it was down to, I think it's dedication and passion for growing onions. It's really interesting, the guy there on the right, uh, down in Suffolk, I met him out in the field, obviously with social distancing, um, but, um, there we were looking at these onions. He topped those. He'd done a fantastic job. He really had. And, uh, and credit due to him, he'd been looking after them, irrigating them all the way through the season. And that's what you end up with. Twitter. Really interesting for me, Twitter. I, I, I look at a lot of the farmers who are on Twitter and I think, great, really. It's promoting onions. It's promoting the industry. I think it's really good. And uh, this really showed you right the way from the, the beginning of the season where Sam's written there, you know, um, about uh, irrigating his onions. I obviously was out with my son doing counts. And, uh, and then the differences and then the bottom right, you can see ideal conditions for harvesting. I put this, this on because uh, uh, and you'll see there's some brassicas as well there. I think it's it's really quite uh, a good thing, social media, in terms of reaching the general public. And you can see, you know, there's some really great work that people are doing, not just in onions, but also brassicas and any veg, which is great. I was really looked at Sam's piece down there, and I thought, that's fantastic, because I remember seeing his granddad I, well, it must have been nearly 30 years ago and saying about promoting onions. And it's really good that carrying it on that today. And I was quite proud of this as well as a company that we're, uh, we're also saying about uh, reducing food waste and things like that there. I think that's really, uh, you know, I was really quite proud of that. And we had over 3000 views. And, and this was a good one down at the bottom here. I think this is Chris Patterson from Elsom's. I think he's put, it's really good piece regarding ch his chicken bolty uh, down in Watplode, St. Ca is it St. Catharines or somewhere like that there anyway. And um, I'm sure that there's an onion in that bolty, Chris. So really great work there. Just on the areas, um, the last 10 years, we've seen a, a, a decrease in, in the area of, uh, of browns by 18%. And the reds have increased by 44%. Uh, that is, you know, um, quite, I wouldn't say staggering, but it was, it was always on the cards. And, uh, and I think at some stage, they'll obviously um, get too many reds in terms of for the marketplace. But at the moment, it's still a popular uh, item. Um, but uh, the overall area was down last year, um, just fractionally. And I think yields overall were fractionally down. On the wholesale market, this, this, is, this might look very, very uh, up and down, but it, it's relatively, relatively stable for, for an onion market, that is. So uh, these, these are the prices. And how do I see it going into the new year, uh, where we are, obviously? Um, there's people saying there's quite a lot of big onions. Well, that's no surprise because of we had uh, less than ideal establishments. So we're gonna get some big onions. Um, the Polish are already trying to export to us um, because of they've got, I wouldn't say they've got a big crop, but the processing uh, um, job has been very poor, which you'll, you'll see. Um, that's vision one of our, our main varieties, um, and it's a consistent performer um, and long-term storage. So excellent uh, root system in, in dry seasons. 
you know, so it's great in dry summers when we keep getting these extremes and it's an early variety with high yield. Motion, high yielding, good for single centres. Um, and, it's, and it's increasing in popularity, I think, down to its uh, high yielding ability, really. So it's an excellent overall uh, yielding, very uniform variety. These are new, uh, early maturing, uh, dark, upright foliage and nation. And the, and the things that I hi highlight there is good herbicide tolerance and this high yielding. And it's good, good storage, which you expect from Syngenta varieties, and it's vigorous. There's a video here, which I'm going to try to do, and I might have to do the voiceover because apparently it doesn't work uh, on Zoom. So I'm going to try this. If it doesn't work, we'll move to the next one. I don't know whether you can hear this, but we're looking at Syngenta's new variety. It's a variety number, nation. Yeah. So we're at, we're, at, we're at Richard Blackhurst anyway, and Richard says a, a, a bit of stuff. This is Luke, uh, who assessed the trial, yeah. And here's Richard. Yeah, Dom does the drilling. Um, and Richard makes a comment regarding uh, how, how much he liked the writing. So, um, so I asked him what his impression was. And, uh, and it is, it, I think it's a really, the variety nation, it strikes me that it's, uh, yeah, there we were in April, 100 bulbs, only one with Fusarium, we'd say that which we thought was good. Um, size is fantastic, skin finish is fantastic, the firmness is fantastic. And this was in his, this was in his, uh, just kept in his, um, in his office. So overall, very impressed. He liked the variety and he wasn't by himself on that. Trying to go to the next slide. Promotion, this is another one that we introduced, uh, 8359. Uh, uh, they like it in Holland, it's high yielding. Mid late maturity, I found it sort of lateish for myself but it has good skin uh, retention and it's excellent. Uh, it is very good long-term storage uh, and it's a motion type. Just on uh, Fusarium, um, seems to be two main rules really with Fusarium, uh, rotation, and I think a minimum of six to seven years is absolutely vital. And um, one of the things that I've often said to people, you cannot put in an Excel sheet how much the value of rotation is. So um, anyway, and the other thing is root, root stress of just reducing root stress of any sort. So the controls are cultural. Variety, sorry to tell you, I still think it's, it's some way away. I think maybe 10 years away, personally. There is, there is some out there, but... It's, it's, it's still to be proved. So this is um, herbicide damage. Uh, they're trying to control the campion. I understand that. We've got to take out the campion. Um, but I think it can also lead to some of this at times. I truly do. Um, also into rowing, any form of into rowing. Damage, you know, any, any form of into rowing with the cultivation uh, can cause that. Uh, so into row spraying, I really think, is, is, is the way forward with a lot of these crops. Land preparation and irrigation. I mean, you know, I know it was very, very difficult last year, but any form of, of, of damage to the root system, you, you, you get these issues. And even, be, yeah, bean seed fly, an onion fly, any sort of damage to the root, uh, we're in trouble. Right, I put this, this is almost to the end now. Uh, I've got, um, we're doing some uh, seed treatment uh, this year, some trials with Insure Duo. It shows that uh, as Syngenta, uh, we do look for solutions for growers, even if it's outside of Syngenta uh, remit. And I think doing these trials is good, uh, you know, improving because neck rot, has been quite an issue for some growers this year. 
I'm pleased to say I'd like to think most of our material has been very, very good, but there has been some issues I know in neck right this year. So finally, uh, a successful crop protection starts from seeds. I've, I mean, I often do this uh, presentation down in Suffolk for, for, for the Suffolk and Essex growers, which is great. Always like to leave a piece at the end uh, to think about and successful crop protection starts from seeds. So thank you very much, Rebecca. That's all I, I need to say, unless there's any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I don't think there's anything that we need to address right this minute. So we'll say, say things till the end, uh, but just to remind people that the, to, to put any questions they have in the Q&A. So we'll now move on to, to Michael Tate, um, who will give us an update on, on the fungicide position in alliums. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, Michael Tate with Syngenta, uh, technical manager looking after the veg products and also potatoes. So what I was gonna do this morning was to cover a bit about um, a sort of regulatory update because there's quite a lot going on as often the case in regulatory affairs at the moment. So a brief update on that. And then talk to you a bit about our product that we're launching this year Arondis Plus uh, for use in alliums and indeed lettuce crops. So just going to run through that for the next few minutes. Assuming that the slides will move anyway. Right, I'll start on the regulatory update. So I think there was a degree of surprise when um, CRD decided that uh, though the EU was going to end um, Mancazeb at the end of January 2021, that we would extend it out to um, the end of uh, 2024. Now, I think there are a couple of caveats with that. First of all, the HSE stroke CRD can at any time during that period still revoke um, the approval and as it has been now sort of revoked apart from the use up period in the European Union, I think that's still a quite a strong possibility. We've been asked by a few people whether or not Fubol Gold will be available this year. And the answer to that is yes, we've been in discussion with um, distributors and have made a, a, an estimate of how much the market will need this year. So there should be some Fubol Gold around, uh, at least for this year. And then obviously we'll review what's happening uh, at CRD during this coming season. Other issues in terms of products around metal axle. Um, we are in a situation where a number of our important outdoor sea treatments um, will no longer be usable after the 1st of June this year uh, due to issues with sea treatments and metal axle M. We're still in discussion with CRD about this and still at least hopeful we might get some change in the view, but at the moment, uh, you won't be able to use metal axle based seed treatments outdoors after the beginning of June. So again, that's a sort of a keep a watching brief on that to see if we have any success in maybe postponing that decision a bit, because we do have a lot of data to substantiate use of metal axle M as a seed treatment. Now, of course, one of the things about Brexit was um, taking back control, and indeed that will be happening. And we've seen evidence of that, for example, with what's happened with uh, Mancaseb, and also with the fact that CRD are going to uh, extend uh, the transition period. So products that were going to go at the end of the transition period will be given a three-year um, extra period in which to be used. And so again, we'll see how they manage that. At the moment, CRD are under a lot of pressure. They've got quite a big uh, backlog of work. So again, we'll see how that works out in the next uh, couple of seasons and what happens in terms of our independent approach towards pesticide registration. From the seed point of view, which can be very important, particularly in the veg sector, there are also some issues on the horizon. Uh, until uh, the end of December um, 2023, you're going to be able to import um, treated seeds. But after that, it gets more complicated because you'll still be able to import treated seeds, but 
that the product that's on those um, seeds has to be approved in the UK and it will have to be approved on the crop which you're looking to import. So I think there are some challenges coming up in that area in the future. We do have a little bit of time to consider how that's going to be sort of managed um, as we go forward. Now I'd like to talk to you a bit about our new product, um, Arondis Plus. We're very excited to be in a position to uh, introduce a new product, particularly into the sort of the veg sector, um, where there are obviously new products that come through, but not perhaps as regularly as in, say, the cereal sector. So I've got a short video here. It's just under two minutes long. Um, as with Nigel, I'm not quite sure how the sound will play, but I'll sort of talk over a bit and we will be able to give you a link so that you can go and have a look at it if the sound doesn't work very well over the Zoom system. So uh, say, bear with me, but I think it's quite useful because it does give you um, a good illustration of how the product works and, and some of the important features of the product. So it's a new chemistry that we've developed in conjunction with um, DuPont originally, and we share this chemistry with Corteva now. Highly active material uh, with very, very high level of potency. It's been used a lot, as I'm sure you'll be aware, in potatoes where it is truly exceptional. I've seen it in onions where it's very, very good but perhaps not quite as exceptional as it is in the potato crop. So you need to be careful to use it as a protectant um, rather than believing you've got curative properties, particularly in onions. As you've seen, it goes into the uh, leaf structure to help protect it from rain and wash off. For resistance management reasons, we'll be promoting only in combination with Amistar as a sort of a partner to reduce the risk of resistance developing to this exciting new chemistry. And I think this sort of using the two products together with the slightly different modes of action, particularly against onion downy mildew, will, will be important and adding in the um, Amistar will also broaden the spectrum of disease that you'll be able to control. So that, that gives you just a quick snapshot of the, of the product. New chemistry, very highly active, but important to use it in combination to minimize the risk of developing resistance. So what I'd like to do now is just to say, show you some results and also to say a little bit about the actual label that uh, we'll be running with here in the UK. So essentially there are two crop areas we're active in, uh, lettuce and the alliums, particularly onions. And you'll see that our partner product is going to be Amistar in both those crops. And for the onion crop, you've got uh, 0.2 of a litre of Arondis Plus combined with a litre of Amistar to give you that broad spectrum control and also to uh, minimize the risk of resistance developing an onion downy mildew. Maximum of three applications per crop. Now Arondis itself would have a seven day PHI, but because you're combining it with the Amistar, you then need to be sure that you are observing the Amistar PHI, which is 14 days. So this little uh, table here gives you a bit of a comparison, particularly in the onion crop, where you've got two um, materials you could use. You've got Arondis Plus with Amistar, and you've got the Zorvec Endavia from Corteva. Uh, the Endavia, uh, Zorvec Endavia combines oxythiopiprolene with uh, benthiavalacarb. You'll see there, there are slightly different rates of OXTP used by these two products. And of course, they have slightly different uh, capabilities because of their partners, Amistar in our case and benthiavalacarb in the case of Corteva. That addition of the benthiavalacarb means that with Zorvec and Davia, you've got a 21 day PHI, whereas with um, Arondis Plus and Amistar, it's down to 14 days. In terms of how things will be presented to the market, uh, we're presenting it as a co-pack uh, with Arondis Plus as a litre 
and five liters of Amistar. So this is a key part of the resistance management strategy to which both companies are committed. And again, so that's just to emphasize that, that Corteva uh, are going with uh, Benthia Valacarb. In future, we will be bringing to the market a co-form with uh, OXTP and Amistar, but that's a few years away yet. Just like to um, go through a few results to highlight a few important points here for you. Uh, now, this is some really quite old data from our R&D department. And on this chart here, this is a measure of how much pressure there was in the uh, trial, very high level of um, onion downy mildew pressure. And you can see that OXTP on its own didn't do such a great job, but combine it with an adjuvant and, and it's done a cracking job, even under this extreme pressure. This is another trial, which also does a very um, similar sort of thing, looking at a number of different materials. Here you've got um, Arondis with an adjuvant working to give 90% control, less pressure in this trial, but it's showing it's working well. And an indication that um, Rivas with an adjuvant can give some activity as well, which is something in the past we've not really pursued, but I think with an adjuvant, there is some evidence that it could work. Now, 2020 was a very difficult year for onion downy mildew trials. So I'm referring back to work done by my predecessor, Simon Jackson in 2019, to show you some sort of results, because at least in 2019, they got quite a decent amount of disease pressure. The idea of this trial was to look at using um, this is the code number here for Rondus Plus, along with Amistar. Here is one example of an adjuvant in the form of Activator 90. This is ActiRob B, also known as Phase 2. And we're just looking here at the maximum number of applications and interspersing with Mancoseb shorter treatments. And there was a standard that was put into the trial just to sort of give some comparison. I think there are a few points to come out of the trial which are interesting. The few bowl goal performed particularly well. The Amistar on its own with Acturob B gave some control of Danny Milji, but wasn't really as good as you'd have liked, but it was giving some activity in this trial. Put it with um, oxythiopiprolin or Rondus Plus on its own, gained better, but then you can see here that where you've added either Activator 90 or Acturob B, again, you've got a further improvement in the level of efficacy that you're seeing in those programs. So I think that's an important sort of message to bear in mind that in the onion crop, the use of adjuvants is, a, is, is really a very good idea. Just a few photographs to illustrate this. You've got two beds here that have got um, Amistar with Acturob, and these are the untreated checks on the two beds on the right. And that's the same for all of these pictures as I quickly go through them. So you can see here, you've got the Amistar, um, the Arondis Plus and Activator 90 compared to the check, Fubol Gold compared to the check, and the standard compared to the check. So it gives you an idea of how uh, these programs are working in the field. In 2019, my Dutch colleagues also did some trials, um, whereas in 2020, like ourselves, they had problems in getting any data at all. Their approach was to have a nine spray program and to intersperse um, you know, the, the, the key products um, between dithane treatments. In um, the Netherlands, they tended to have used Adigor as the adjuvant rather than Acturob or Activator, which is we've used here in the UK. So again, you just to show you the results, and you can see here that the um, Arondis Plus with Amistar and Adigor gave the best overall result. Amistar on its own did a little bit better than it did in our own trial on its own. Uh, but again, it shows that adding it to um, the Arondis Plus gives you a, a better, more reliable result. Not such a big difference here with the addition of the adjuvant that we've seen in our trials, but nevertheless, there is a difference. Last year, we tried quite a complicated trial at both Vegetable Consultancy Services and the Allium and Brassica Center, looking again at um, adjuvants and the positioning of the product within programs. But I'm afraid to say we just really didn't get enough onion downy mildew in the trial to come up with any sensible sort of conclusions. 
before I sort of finish on the issue of trials, I'll just address one extra point, and that is the addition of Amistar. Uh, you've seen in some of those trials that the Amistar is contributing towards the downy mildew control. And this is a trial from the Netherlands done a few years ago, looking specifically at rates of Amistar and um, control of onion downy mildew. And in comparison at that time with folio gold, which uh, obviously gave a very good result, but it's no longer available. And interestingly here, you've got some activity against botrytis. And again, you've got some nice activity um, from the Amistar in that trial. And in the second trial that they did, you've got an almost identical pattern. So I think it shows that the Amistar is contributing both towards um, the control of the onion downy mildew, but also potentially helping you with other diseases which may come in. So just in summary, I think um, onion growers have got um, the capability to go on using Mancseb for a while, but the, um, it is uncertain a little bit, I think, how long that will be available. So it's important to start thinking about how programs are constructed, which may not need any Mancseb based products. And within that, I think um, Rondus Plus with Amistar will form a vital component and will have to be matched in with other materials within an overall spray program to keep the crop free and yielding well. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much indeed. And obviously if you've got questions, then we'll try to address those. Brilliant, thank you very much, Michael. Um, well, at the minute, I think we can pass things over to the end. Um, so we'll ask Max if he can join us and share his presentation. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Michael. Uh, so yes, I'm Max Newbert. I'm the technical manager for the UK looking after insecticides uh, across all crops. So as such today, I'm going to give an update, a bit like Michael, first start on the regulatory update, for a pipeline, and then I'll finish on a um, update around Minecto, and hopefully we've got time to touch on um, application as well. So for the regulatory update, um, starting with Lambda. So this, this is talking about Lambda Cyhalothrin as an AI. It is going uh, under re-registration right now. Uh, as such, uh, the, anything that happens to the label for Lambdas will affect all products containing Lambda Cyhalothrin. Um, we don't necessarily have the specifics right now for what the outcome is, but CRD have um, obviously indicated to us a few things that the likelihood is we're going to have a reduction on the crops that it can be applied to and then the crops that remain the uh, rates will be reduced on some and then there could be potentially as well the reduction of the number of total applications so overall the it's a reduction in uh, lambda use going forwards uh, we're not sure when the um, outcome will be um, announced uh, it's been going for quite a long time as you might imagine with such a large uh, AI with many products such as Lambda Cyhalothrin. But when we have the details, we will um, uh, announce it to the industry. The other area that's um, been going through regulatory updates is uh, teflufrin, obviously in reference to force ST. The active substance teflufrin went through in 2019, got reapproved, uh, and we don't um, anticipate any further assessment until 2024 and then product re-registration in 2027. But focusing in a bit on uh, force itself, so uh, we have faced some issues around force for the emus. So when um, it re registration happened for the AI, we moved across a new map number for force ST, uh, and as such, we were then would have to have moved over any of the minor uses onto that. However, it became apparent we faced some issues where, um, because we're basing on the sugar beet label, uh, which as you can see on screen, the rate for sugar beet is 13 grams a hectare at most. Um, for horticultural and veg use, we can, as you can see with an example there, the dose rate per unit of seed and the planting density means we can be, in some examples in onions, over double that. The second problem we face is the fact that um, sugar beet is a pelleted seed rather than film coated. So this is something we're going to have to address with um, CRD with the help of AHDB. Uh, first of all, to, to find out what work we need to do or if it is okay to make sure that it stays on film code to seed rather than just person. If we get over that hurdle, then we have to address the grammage. Um, and if we have to stick to the 13 grams a hectare, we have to do some efficacy work to see if we still get 
uh, acceptable levels of efficacy for the project at that point. So this is one of the major focuses for us this year. Um, and there, you know, we do have plans for ongoing development to make sure that we have some options in this area for controlling these types of pests. Um, but just to note, we reverted to the old map number when this all happened um, as such, so that we could for a short time, while we, we need to generate the data and information to overcome this issue, for the emus, we were allowed to produce and sell the old map number up until the end of last year, which went into the seed houses for seed dressing, um, which can go all the way up to the end of this year. So for this year, Force ST can be used for its emus, um, and any force seed produced this year that is available can be used next year. The caveat with that will be there the production, the amount of seed that will be available next year with Force ST is probably going to be limited and anything that is treated is likely to have a reduction in efficacy due to the fact Tefluferin does volatilize. As such, the efficacy, as the further time you get away from application on the seed, the efficacy will go down as a reduction AI stays on the seed. So that's just an update. As time goes on, we'll inform you of the changes that we find out going forwards. But moving on to sort of the more positive side, so the product pipeline, this might be more for a general veg piece, uh, but to, to inform you from the Syngenta side, what we're anticipating in the pipeline around insecticides in my portfolio. And primarily, you know, the, the first thing in it is um, a very rapid uh, product. In 2022, we're going to introduce a Finto, which is a finicamid product, foliar spray, and it will have the same label as Topeki, so Topeki clone, and we're accessing this, uh, accessing this from ISK. So obviously this gives another option to growers and um, uh, another company to develop the product with. So going forward, we'll do some work around uh, best use for a Finto, but that will be in uh, the market and for sale in 2022. Totally new product. Um, it says from 2025 plus on there. I, I would be a bit more conservative and probably say 2027. Now this is Spiripidion. Some people might have read some articles around this. This is a new AI that we've introduced in some locations around the world. The UK is now in scope for this, um, and this is a completely new AI. It does have a similar mode of action to Spira Tetramat. As such, it will be a bit slower acting than uh, other types of insecticides, but it does give very good control uh, in the trial data I've already seen. Uh, the other thing with this is it's very IPM compatible because it seems to have an extremely safe beneficial profile, which is always good. When it does come to market, it will be very much targeted at the veg sector. And this will be because it is for sucking pests, white fly and scale. Um, as time goes on, I'll, I'll come back in the following year once we've done more uh, trials data generation for our climate and market. But that's something that will be coming uh, within the next sort of five to seven years. But moving on to what we currently have, so um, Minecto One in particular um, is a product we introduced uh, relatively recent for the Allium markets. At the moment, um, I'll get onto the label, it's for uh, onions. Um, we are anticipating to get it at, on leak at some point, but we are waiting for uh, MRL uh, confirmation. And until that happens, we can't get the leaks on the label. Um, but for the market, it will work uh, very well for onion thrips. But I thought I'd just put this slide up on the screen because um, what we have on the Minecto label and what it has activity against are two separate things. We do find a very good level of incidental control on quite a wide range of insect pests. So on the screen, you can see Minecto 1 um, at the top, along with other options you might have in the industry. Uh, and what their relative spectrums are against the pests on the left. And I've given them a sort of general indication of activity you would expect to see with three ticks being excellent control all the way down to one tick not being very good, or an X if it doesn't have uh, control, or a dash if it's not applicable. So just with Minecto 1, you can see anything in green um, in this column is things we've seen either in trial or in the field since the launch of the product. Um, you know, and in, and a few notable things is obviously on the label, it's very much a chewing pest product. Uh, but we do get good control sucking pests such as uh, peach potato aphid, um, leaf miners as well, um, caterpillar uh, or fly leaf miners, it gets uh, very good control. The only caveat is in certain crops, and I'll get onto that in the next slide, there might need to be a um, uh, adjuvant added to get the WG formulation of Minecto into the plant. But just gives you an idea. Now I'm not claiming this is a, a complete aphid side because you can see, especially with the black bean aphid and 
the current lesser aphid, there are specific species which seem to have uh, no efficacy from an ecto-1. So it's not a pure aphicide, but we do get good activity on a wide range of pests. But just to sort of uh, make a simplistic form of understanding of where best to use an adjuvant to get the best incidental control of second pests from an ecto-1, I've done a chart here and we've got the different or grouped to crops we've got the label for currently. And you can see uh, the inclusion of methylated rapeseed oil um, recommendation. Now, this is a, a high percent methylated rapeseed oil. So this would be 90% plus would be ideal, about half a litre in the tank. And that will give you the efficacy you'd need. Because in, specifically brassicas, I know this is an allium event, but for brassicas, because they're so waxy as a crop, uh, we find that it doesn't penetrate get into the xylem because it's a xylem modable product to then um, target the pest of interest or leaf borer as well. Um, but focusing on alliums, um, you'll see in the data I've, I've put together for this uh, webinar, there isn't necessarily a statistical improvement in control. However, it's advised due to standard practice in the um, crops. Also, it can help with getting that active down into the crown to make sure that we're targeting the thrift itself. Um, so there's just some sort of quick advice around uh, if you would get better control with methylated rapeseed or not for the different crops. Um, but for the Allium label in particular, this is what we currently have. As I said, we hope to get leaks on at some point, but we're bulb onions, salad onions, shallots and garlic, targeting onion thrips. Now the Minecto 1 label for Alliums is slightly different because we only have one application rather than two like the other crops, and it's at a, at a higher rate of 0.31 kilograms a hectare. And you can see the post-harvest interval of 14 days there. Now, just as a reminder what Minecto 1 is, it's um, a diamide, so it uh, targets the muscles uh, of the insect, so it's relatively fast acting, um, but it's a second generation diamide. So previous experience of diamides probably would have been chlorantranilaprol, things like corrigin. Um, however, corrigin is very different to Minecto 1. Um, its activity is primarily around the Lepidoptera moth pests, whereas Minecto 1, as we've seen in the previous slide, has a very large broad spectrum. Uh, so it does make it very different to maybe different diamides you've experienced in the past. So that's just a bit of background on what the active is of Minecto 1. Now I'm just gonna go through some trials data. The first lot of this is from our R&D work when we were scoping out the product and how it compared to a standard auto with and without different adjuvants. As we know that sometimes Minecto 1 does interact with adjuvants quite well. Uh, so this is an, uh, an R&D trial you can see we had uh, a lot of applications through the season and we've had Spinosad as the standard and then with Trend 90 being very much like Activator 90 and Act Rob B being primarily uh, phase two. And you can see, as I was saying, there might be a slight improvement with adjuvant, but overall we get very consistent control and very good comparatively to standards such as Spinosad. And then just looking at that trial and as a final leaf assessment, what the sort of damage levels were with some stats on, and you can see here, um, Although the phase two, yes, we might have had a numerical difference. All, all of the products worked statistically similar. So it is a good product uh, comparatively. And the use of adjuvants aren't necessarily advisable, but would potentially get better application for things like onions and um, eventually leeks. Just a different trial here, um, again with uh, PCG and very similar approach. And you can see again, this one, you can a little bit clearer that maybe the uh, phase two oil adjuvant could be helping with spreading and wetting of the leaf, getting better activity from the Minecto one. But again, very comparable control to spin has had overall through the program. So it's a it's a good product. Plus in this one, we can see we, we were testing out Benibia and we were getting a better uh, numerical control with inclusion of an adjuvant with uh, Benibia being an OD formulation versus Minecto one's WG but very good control from that trial again, as you can see from the final assessment and the mean number of frips that we had at the end of the trial. So again, you can see why it's advised, but it's not necessary, um, necessary to have that adjuvant. But to make it a bit more real world and applicable, we did a, in 2019, um, we did some work uh, in the fens with uh, Minecto 1, and this was a bit more real world applicable where we were looking at um, it was an irrigated field, but what we were looking at was one application of Minecto 1, one application of Minecto 1 with um, the phase two actual B type, and that was at the T1, you can see in July there. And then two applications of the rest of the products, so Benivia, um, Iskaya, and uh, Spire Touch, uh, sorry, Spinosad there, Tracer. So as you can see, 
we had very good control of all programs. Um, pressure on the site was there, but it wasn't inordinately high. So we had very good control. So looking at the damage is more interesting. So you can see the untreated versus the different treatments there. And you can see how one application met to one compared to the double applications of everything else. And it worked exceedingly well. Um, and we got very good levels of control there. So it's a very good product. It has a good position in the market on top of the fact, you know, with thrips and uh, uh, resistance management, it's, it's good to have in the program, especially as now there has been some spin aside resistance picked up as well. So it's a very good product for alliums and trolling thrips. So that was just what I wanted to talk around use of Meta one in alliums. Um, now I'm going to talk about what, uh, again, former colleague Simon Jackson, the predecessor of Michael Tate, carried out in 2019, which was some application work um, in onions. And one, obviously, this is good information, but two, the nozzle that um, Simon was trialing in this, which was a developmental nozzle from Syngenta, is now going to be released this year. So um, if it is of interest, there will be the availability, hopefully later this season, to buy it and trial it out on farm. So the work carried out was primarily looking um, at deposition and coverage on onions, uh, and we were looking at forward speed, water volume, and nozzle choice. The nozzles were um, the 3D90, so this is a 55 degree, 90% uh, drift reduction nozzle, um, and when the new four-star LERAP comes out, that will be a four-star. We were trialing against a current offer, so this is a uh, Leckler IDTA. This is a double fan, uh, flat fan nozzle air injection, and you can see the degree angles on the front and back facing uh, side there. So this is what we we're trialing out to see if we could get good or better coverage in allium crops. So this was the treatments we had. So you can see the different nozzles there, uh, primarily focused on the IDTA, but we did have um, a 3D90 nozzle in there. Um, you can see the different water volumes we were using. Uh, forward speed differences, um, bar and obviously it, this trial we didn't use an adjuvant. Uh, we did do some work at 2020 uh, with some adjuvants and drift retardants, um, but it showed very much what we showed in this trial generally. So how the application trial was done, the applications were done, then uh, the products, well, what was sprayed was a helio um, fluorescent dye so that we could visualize it under UV and understand deposition on the leaf. Once the application was made through those treatments, the bulbs were removed and discarded from the leaves. Um, and you can see certain bits were discounted, such as the senescing leaves, but then we were taking certain subsamples of that, taking photography, taking measurements to see where the products, uh, the dye went, and we could then get an understanding of what was best for deposition on the plants. And these were the sort of results. So you can see the sort of deposition uh, on the left hand side and we were segregating it into the, the leaf and then going down into the stem either the middle or the outside and the first bit we were looking at you can see the effect of forward speed here and where the deposition was most and it quite starkly points out that the 10k seemed to be the best optimum for deposition and obviously work rate will be quite good at 10k as well but you can see where most goes is obviously on the leaf much less on the stem um, inside and outside but again, still one of the highest deposition levels for the centers there. So for my point of view in threat control, that was interesting to see. And just a visual of that. Uh, so this is the Helios gel um, UV uh, images. And you can see the different nozzles and the different work rates there. Um, but visually you can see how eight and especially 10K looks like it has the best deposition on the leaf. And that's what happened from when we did the studies on them. So that was really good to see. And then looking at the stem itself, you can see again, eight and especially 10K, they're looking very good. So this is what I was interested in to see that data. Next was sort of the effect of water volume. Um, and this has come through in our application um, advice as well, the TU on that as well, uh, which is, you can see the water, uh, water rate here, 100 litres, 200 litres and then 400 litres. And you can see for this trial, deposition was actually visually best um, on the crop when we were going at that uh, 200 litre mark. So that's our advice around onions. And again, just visually, you can see that quite starkly here, the 100 and 400 looking uh, very much off the pace compared to the 200 litres in this trial. And again, on the stem, again, you can see, especially on some, we were getting very good levels of deposition uh, comparatively to um, the other treatments. So we've obviously focusing on, on 10K, 200 litres being uh, the ideal um, 
sort of rates and speeds for application. Next was looking at that ideal scenario, so 200 litres is 10K, of the two different types of 90% uh, reduction nozzles. And you can see here what we have between the new 3D90 that will be available this year versus the RDTA Leckler. And again, higher levels of deposition with the 3D90 with its uh, development that we conducted at Jellets Hill. Not only on the leaf itself, but you can see we do have uh, substantial increases, especially on the stem and um, on the inside and in the middle of it. So that was really positive as well. And just visually there, so we've got the two images of the IDTA on the left and then two images of the 3D90 on the right. And you can see the higher level of deposition on the 3D90. And then on the stem as well, very similar pattern, we were getting very good levels of deposition on the stem from the angled 3D90. So this, this is, uh, you know, what our recommendations will be when it comes uh, to market. We, we're seeing that 200 litres, 10K with 3D90, especially at the larger crops, that will be where it fits. But you can just see all those put on the, on the chart there around water uh, rate and where the 3D90 sits. So it, it is working very well. So from my point of view of thrip control, that could be a really interesting option for growers going forwards. So I'll just take this snippet from uh, what our current application guidelines are from our uh, technical update sheet. Uh, so you've got onions and leeks there, and I've just put an asterisk for when you're getting to those larger crops, we'll probably be moving advice to the 3D90. So this, this nozzle will be available. Um, I've just been told this morning by Harry Fordham, uh, application manager, that it will be available in March, and we're expecting um, it to be £15 or when we do the, the half price deal, it'll be £7.50 for the nozzles. So with that, that's everything I would like to cover for my piece and I'll hand back to Rebecca. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Max, that's great. Um, if you could just stop sharing the screen for me, then we can, um, if the other presenters can, can join us again, then we can go through the, the questions that people have, have put on. Brilliant, thank you. So the first question here is to Michael um, and around OXTP. Are there any scenarios where the addition of an adjuvant should be avoided, such as other crop stresses, etc.? Well, there probably are, um, but we've not come across them in the trials that we've run. Um, generally, the benefit we've seen from using um, Rondis Plus with an adjuvant outweigh any downsides that I've seen so far in the crop, but there may well be there are circumstances which are sufficiently stressing to the crop where you've lost so much of the leaf wax that you wouldn't do it. But I would think that's probably unusual. Uh, so I say certainly I've not seen it in the trials that we've done. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got another question here on Arondis. Will you be getting Arondis Plus approved in salad onions? I'll let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in answer to that at the moment, the, the situation um, is no. Um, it's, it's slightly complicated, um, as Michael mentioned in his presentation, this is a shared active ingredient between Syngenta and Corteva. Um, and the agreement is at the moment that Corteva own the, the data package on it. So for EMU extensions and things like that, that is quite tricky at the moment. Obviously, you can't do it with the Zorvec product because the benthivive alicarb isn't approved in the alliums. Um, so we're working with AHDB at the moment to see if there's some ways around this um, where we can collaborate with Corteva to do this. So watch this space um we are working on it but it's it's complicated i think is the the easy answer there um the other question i had on here max was when the the, the nozzles would be available and how much they were but I, you covered that so we're looking at around march time um and full price is around 15 quid um but when we do the half price office they'll be at the at the seven pounds 50 so we've covered that let me just check the other box to see if there's any other questions. No, that's all the questions I have in at the minute. So unless anyone types very quickly while I'm wrapping up, 
Um, so just to remind people that you will receive um, an email tomorrow um, at the earliest where you'll be able to claim your basis and, and the Rosso points. Um, and again, there'll be a, a link to a small survey in there that we'd be very grateful if you could, um, could complete that for us. And all that leaves me to do is thank the presenters very much for your input um, and your time this morning. Thank you to those on the other end of the, the computers that have um, attended and joined the webinar and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend and we hope to see you in the flesh very soon. Thank you, Sam. Goodbye, everybody. Cheers. Thanks all.